Welcome to Board Game Nation. My name is Gary Blevins. Thank you so much for watching. Today we are thrilled to welcome a very special guest. He's an early hero of mine, a legendary game designer, and just, you know, an incredibly nice man, Mr. Larry Harris. Now, Larry Harris is most famous for creating his board game series, Axis and Allies, which included 20 different tabletop games, as well as a number of online versions. Four of his Axis and Allies games won Origins Awards, including the induction of the original game into the Academy of Adventure Gaming Arts and Design Hall of Fame in 1996. But Axis and Allies is just a piece of his extensive career. During his first year at Milton Bradley, 13 games of his design were featured in the company's catalog, including the three initial games from the Game Master series, including Conquest of the Empire, Broadside and Boarding Parties, and of course, Axis and Allies. He also designed for a number of other companies, including Mattel, Coleco, Parker Brothers, Hasbro Games Group, and Hasbro Interactive. He's also assisted with the further development of a few games that, uh, that sold a few copies, I think. Trivial Pursuit and Risk, maybe you've heard of him. Larry most recently published an incredible game called War Room. Now, while this is a historical game that centers around World War II, it's very different than Axis and Allies, starting with one of the coolest game boards I have ever seen. You'll have to check it out. Now, he's currently developing a new game called Imperial Borders, and we can't wait to dive into it. Without further ado, please welcome Larry Harris. So, Larry, thank you so much for taking the time to, to talk with us today. We're super excited to, to, to meet you and learn about kind of a little bit about your history, about the games that you've got coming up, and, of course, to talk about uh, Axis and Allies. So, uh, off the top, let me ask, uh, it looks like you had a chance to watch the Board Game Nation, uh, Axis and Allies, How to Play, 1942. Uh, I'm curious, how did we do? <laughs> you uh, were charming. Uh, you were... Um inviting and so we i was getting ready to go to bed and it was very very late and uh but yet i stopped and said to myself i'll give this a second i want to i want to see what this is about and it caught me immediately and kept me there and uh till the end and i felt like um that was that was refreshing somehow it was uh, friendly and informative and and i then you know made contact so yeah well, and again, I really appreciate you taking the time to, to watch it and give us your feedback and, and of course, your time today. Um, did we get all the rules right? I guess that's the, that's the thing that, that I'm, you know, I appreciate the, the positive feedback. I want to make sure we got the rules right. Nothing shocked me or left any, no, no, it was cool. But by the way, I, I've been a little bit removed from Action Allies lately, so it was a refresher course for me uh, in a big way because I've been working on other projects and uh, have been out of the Axis and Allies uh, area for, you know, the last five years. Not that Axis and Allies is ever far from my attention, but I, uh, some, some details and rules slip, and so I wouldn't have picked up on yours. Well, cool. Well, um, again, I love that you, that you watched it, and, and thanks for the, all the feedback. Uh, okay, so uh, I will say that over the course of your in incredible career, you have designed some of the world's most famous historical games, not just Axis and Allies, but also Conquest of the Empire, uh, War Room, and now soon to be uh, Imperial Borders, which uh, we're certainly looking forward to hearing more about. But I guess my question is, when you're looking at a project like this and you're looking to take it on a time frame, how in the world do you manage all of the history that goes with a particular time frame like how do you how do you look at all that and make it useful uh, <clears throat> I'll tell you a trick um, it, it, I'm a social scientist as well as a his an amateur historian uh, and I see or I pay attention to what people are being exposed to and uh, in, in my generation we were exposed to what Rome was and so we all have this mental image of Rome and the gladiators and, and the Roman army and a certain image and that, that's been put in my brain and I, that I refer to when I want to incorporate history into an entertaining uh, experience. So uh, I'm, uh, I'm giving you some. I'm giving back to you some f feedback from the movie industry, and and the iconic uh, notions and memories of any given period, be it Napoleon, be it uh, Roman, be it World War II. Uh, I I I, um, I tap into um, popular popular uh, imagery of the period. I think that helps the entertainment side of it. There's always this balance between you know, historical accuracy and 
engaging gameplay. Uh, and you know, I think that part of what you're talking about now is making sure that it's engaging. And if you're, I think if the game is buried in the minutia of you know how much ammunition was in this place or how many units were in this place, if it's buried in that, oftentimes it kind of loses the the fun of it, right? Like you lose the character of it. Totally, it's um, it's entertainment. It's um, yeah. So there's trade-offs to be made between history and um, gameplay, and you, you you try to be a good arbitrator of it all, and um, and but you you pay a a reverence or a bow to history. And then you, you say to yourself, there's only one history and there's plenty of other game mechanics. So let's let history dominate uh, any of these decisions as up to a certain point. And then you have to just go for, um, people have to be able to play this, period. And, and you don't want to vary too far from the classic rolling, you know, the classic game uh, mythology. Well, that's great. So I, I, I think you're right. I think it's, uh, I think it's about balance. So. Uh, I understand that your inspiration for getting into historical gaming and Axis and Allies and uh, what was originally called 1942 uh, comes from a, a fairly personal place, and I wonder if I can ask you about that. Yeah, imagine you're, what was, I don't know, remember, 9, 10, something like this, I find this diary, and uh, it, it's got, he's an artist, my father was a bit of an artist, so there was all these little images as well as the the wording, and I'm, I'm reading about this guy, and it's my father, and he's on this most most amazing adventure. I mean, it starts, he's with the National Guard down in Florida, and the Japanese bomb Pearl Harbor, and he's one of the first people to be sent overseas, because he's already in the National Guard, so they linked up a, a, a National Guard unit from Tennessee, I think that's where you're from, and <clears throat> New England. And they called it the 43rd Infantry Division, and they sent them immediately, without escort, on a troop ship uh, to uh, Guadalcanal to uh, help the uh, Marines there. And um, uh, 5,000 guys, and uh, they were pulling into a, a local, uh, an American, an allied harbor, and they ran into two mines sank in a matter of minutes 5,000 guys got off there was only three casualties but they were shipwrecked and from there then they uh, recovered from that but that was just the beginning of his adventure uh, ships sunk from under him and so on and then and then they're they're moving up through the Solomon Islands uh, fighting the Japanese there in the, in the jungle early on when uh, Really, the United States didn't have air dominance, or it was a rough time uh, in the early war, as we all know, or we should know. And uh, from there, he went to New Guinea and on to uh, the Philippine Islands. He was bombed by Mitsubishi bombers. He was uh, he stood off bonsai charges. He, in the Philippines, they rushed through the lines, went six miles behind the lines, and set up a battalion size observation post uh, behind enemy lines and the Japanese were not happy that they were there. They were attacked every night and uh, just a, a, an amazing story. And then finally he comes home and has me. <laughs> so so uh, that was my introduction to World War II which became, an, it, it, it gave me an, an appreciation for what was history, the notion of history. Um, and uh, it, it all stemmed from that. So that was my inspiration, yes. Well, that's amazing. Um, that that sounds like you should be selling the movie rights. For sure. I mean, it, it it goes into amazing things. Like his best friend uh, from Tennessee, uh, Frank Parks, in case you know him. <laughs> it's my neighbor. He was. Right yeah, well. Uh, Frank Parks, uh, the two of them were foxhole buddies. They went through the whole war together. And in the last days, the closing days of 45 in, in the Philippines, uh, uh, he was shot and killed. On, uh, while my father was manning the uh, company radio, he, he was out in the field with this, uh, I don't know, a recon unit and got killed. And... Uh, Big loss, big story. It would have made an amazing movie. They went to they went to uh, New Zealand together uh, after uh, after fighting through the Solomons. They went to New, New, uh, New Zealand, and both of them young young guys. Uh, 
18, 19 years old, um, discovering this universe of New Zealand and the paradise it represented after they had just been not knowing if they were going to live for another five minutes from a battle zone. And then they find themselves in paradise, and he writes about that. And it would have made a great movie. I really think it would have made a great movie. Who knows? Maybe it will be a great movie. Uh, well, so that's just, that's amazing. And I'm always fascinated by, to me, like history is not about, you know, dates and places and times. It's about the people, right? It's about the, the story that the, that the people came away with or, or didn't, you know, as the case may be. Uh, so I'm always, I'm always fascinated by that. And, um, so I appreciate you sharing that with us. So speaking of your time in the service, I understand you were uh, in the United States Army uh, in the late 60s, early 70s. And I'm, I'm curious if your time in the service um, changed how you viewed history of the U.S. or globally and, and how that might have affected, um, you know, your game theory and your, your approach to game design. Actually, my... Uh, it, it wasn't so much the military. I was already... Um, interested in history when I got into the military, but that, my interest in history, along with the diary and so on, started while, or politics and so on, started while, I lived in Iran for, interestingly enough, my father was uh, in the military, so I was an army brat, and one of our assignments was Iran in the 60s, I arrived in 1960, and believe me, Iran was a third world country, like, really amazing, and uh, so we lived outside of Tehran, about 10, 10 miles outside of Tehran. Loved it, and I, and I saw uh, <clears throat> uh, the people under the Shah at, at that time, and I heard rumors from, of riots in the streets and saw this. Uh, we were out on a hunting trip. I was with my father, and uh, we were hunting for Ibeck uh, in the mountains outside of Tehran, and we had, uh, a, there was a group of us, I was, what, 12, 13 years old. I had, I had an M1 rifle <laughs> with me to shoot on Ibeck, if you can imagine, and uh, along with the rest of the hunting party. And it was a campfire moment at, at late that night. And um, uh, the, the Iranian, uh, there was an Iranian um, soldier assigned to us who was our translator and so on. And we were telling jokes, and it was all about Kennedy and politics back then. And, uh, and it was jokes being exchanged around the campfire. And what I remembered or what shocked me was the Iranian translator saying, uh, telling us, it must be wonderful to be able to laugh about your president. And whereas, of course, the message wow. was that he could not say anything about his Shah or the, you know, that kind of government. And, uh, all these guys who were having a real good time and laughing and raising hell with each other suddenly just stopped and it was this awkward silence and it made an impact on me if no one else I could tell you that and that, that made me conscious of it and then later back to your, your original question there I uh, yeah I went to Paris uh, Supreme Headquarters Allied Powers Europe's shape that was after being in the 82nd don't ask me how that happened and so I uh, find myself uh, in Paris, and um, and and NATO is leaving, or the NATO is leaving France because the Gaulle wanted us out, and uh, so um, I'm arriving just as everybody's leaving, and they're all moving to Mons, Belgium, and I spent the whole summer in Paris, uh, just waiting for further follow-up orders. Uh, worst, there's worse ways to spend a summer than. The, the late 60s in France. <laughs> but while I was there, I went to Normandy. I uh, went and checked out the battlefields of Normandy. I visited Verdun. I uh, took advantage. I was already, as I said, historically conscious uh, or conscious of history. And um, so um, the military gave me an opportunity to, uh, to touch and be next to history. For example... Ultimately, I ended up in Mons, Belgium, uh, where NATO headquarters ended up, shape. And that was only 30 miles from Waterloo, so I spent a lot of time over at the Waterloo uh, Museum and battlefield there. So, again, uh, the military offered me an opportunity to live and be in Europe, where I could actually uh, touch this stuff uh, and be around it. I, I spent a night in... Uh, 
in an off-limits area of Verdun. Uh, the reason why it's off-limits was uh, because there was all kinds of still unexploded ordnance all over the place, so they didn't want anybody in there. That didn't stop me, their little barbed wire fence. I went under it and spent the night in this, uh, in, in this, in this forest, this pine forest. What they did was the place was so, so destroyed and so, um, so unable to be recuperated, they just flew airplanes over it and dropped pine combs all over the place to, uh, to uh, grow back a forest. I went into that forest. I'm telling you, there are ghosts. In this. <laughs> there are ghosts. I heard, smelt felt that battlefield all around me that night. Uh, I was by myself in, in the, that place. It was <laughs> creepy. Verdun was, I, I did a game called 1914, Axe Knowledge 1914, and uh, Verdun was, um, I wrote about Verdun in that, and it, it was a sad place, and the only way you could really experience that was um, to be there and to smell it. I'm sorry, it's going off on it. Yeah, not at all. No, that that's great. Um, I, I tell you, I I think that we could probably just do two hours of stories of summer in Paris. <laughs> oh, oh, so what do we have? This old guy with his uh, reminiscing here? No, no. On, honestly, you know, it's 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 these stories that I think are so important because w without them, we don't have any context, right? Like, without having been there. Right, without having touched it or you know, and and understood what it meant, right? Like, that's that's what makes it not just a date and a and a point on a map, right? It's it's the understanding that oh, those no, were that sure. those were real people, and this was a real thing that happened. So, so yeah, no, I, I appreciate that. We touched on this a little bit before, but but being a lover of history and board games myself, I'm always curious. Uh, how do you find the balance, right? So how do you find the balance between historical accuracy and board game, you know, playability? Uh, more specifically, like, so once you've settled on the mechanic of a game, how do you answer questions like, you know, does a tank defend on a two or a three? Or how many guys are supposed to be in South Africa? Or how much did a fighter cost? Or, or whatever. How do you work out the, the details of the setup and the gameplay so that it's, so that it's fun? and that it's balanced, and that it reflects the historical scenario that you're trying to put your player in. Oh, is that all you want to know? <laughs> That's it, yeah, can you, can, you know, 30 seconds or less. <laughs> uh, yeah, uh, a game has its own ecosystem, and um, uh, there's things I, 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 I visualize the player, and um, and I also know what I want to expose, and I also know it's a balance. I'm pulling from all these resources, all these things that I want to collect. I want to collect balance, game mechanic, history. Uh, I want to put it all together and entertainment. Let's not forget that. And um, and then I'm in the back of my mind. I'm also writing these rules. So and then you put all this together, and you just got to have an oversight view of it from your from your perspective, and know that you don't need to worry about how much gas is in this truck or in this deuce and a half or how far they can drive. Just let them go from land mass to another. People will tolerate that and understand that. Not tolerate it, that's the wrong word, but understand uh, the scale and scope. And and uh, and I I'm also playing with your brain uh, when I'm stirring this up and, 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 and manipulating all these different... Um, sciences or values um wow uh, <laughs> uh it's um it's a complicated thing that i have a talent to do and i don't know I, pluck some questions out of me um <laughs> okay um so m maybe uh, to be more specific so we have you know we went from the classic to uh, which was the original game, Milton Bradley, I think 1984? Yeah, 85, 84, yeah. Yeah, um, and then we had, uh, I think the next one was Revised, right? So, so how, how did you make the shift? Like, what, what, was, the, what was the reflection on Classic that, that set you up to go to Revised? And then from Revised to, you know, the World at War, and then from World at War to, you know, Second Edition. Uh, I guess I'm just trying to see how the evolution comes and how the map changes and how the board changes and um, 
and, and the approach to, to the evolution of it? Um, I don't know how to answer that. Uh, <laughs> I mean, I will say that my guess is that it's a balance of player feedback, play testing, and inspiration. Thank you. Uh, it's all those. <laughs> and, and it really is. Uh, player feedback is important. Also, uh, um, the feedback brings maybe ideas, better ideas or better approaches or points out weaknesses that have to be addressed. Uh, you have to be your own worst critic and know what has to be changed and what's, what's not as good as it could be and what it should be. I'm always um, pleased when I run into people that play Access and Allies, and they seem to be everywhere, right? So it's just kind of this ubiquitous thing. And, and I think the, the reason that that's true and the reason that the game has sold you know, millions and millions of copies is that the basic mechanic is so strong that it allows for uh, an, an ease of understanding and an ease of play, but, but allows the, the layering of the complexity of war um, to be added on to that base mechanic. That often gives rise to an entire universe of house rules. And I'm curious if you have a, uh, a favorite uh, house, set of house rules that have, that have come to you. I'm sure people have sent these to you over the years. Um, and I'm curious if, if you found one that you liked or uh, if anything made it into you know, versions of the game that came forward or, or what, your, what your thoughts are on house rules in general. I pay attention to house rules. Um, I don't know. I can't. I can't. Uh, I can't quote or or call out any particular ones that I've uh, seen over the years. Um, uh, and uh, they themselves, the question themselves, give me an idea of what could be brought to the game. And uh, sometimes uh, they could be the driving force behind actually what. Has changed, and then now you're going to ask me. So, what have you done that were stems from house rules? I really don't remember. I, I couldn't tell you at this point. That's going back a little bit. So, I will say that that um, one of the more popular house rules that I've seen is the introduction of espionage uh, and diplomacy, and some some of the um, some of the complexities that come like from so like, similar to the game diplomacy, right? So, to introduce some of those elements into uh, access and allies, right? It gets to be. Um, I, I've seen that. I've seen that variation a lot, and you know, really, espionage was kind of not an element in any of the access and allies games that I've that I can immediately recall. Um, and so that's that's an area that I see yeah, kind of expanded into a lot from a from a house rules point of view. I'd be curious if you had any thoughts on it. Yeah, es oh, espionage is a great example of a house rule. Uh, it's something that is fun to do and you want to do it. I can't sell you a product or design a product for you that would include that for whatever reason. Maybe it's, 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 it's not for everybody would be not everybody would be interested in that or maybe it, it takes from the uh, main mechanic uh, the price that I would have to pay for it would not be worth it and my return on investment would not be worth it but the idea that you're doing it and incorporating it and if you if you asked me it does it fit in and if I have any suggestions as the uh, creator of the game I would probably answer that and tell you that yeah it's if you're getting pleasure from it and you're having a good time you go for that and it's quite all right and i don't see you upsetting any balance or yes you would upset a balance i would guide you know, or or th those are the questions you should be asking yourself when you inc incorporate your own house rules is are you upsetting the balance uh and if so, are you upsetting it in a, in a bad way or a good way? So, you know. Well, uh, yeah, I'll say the other way that I found house rules used is to balance between the skill of player, right? Yes. So, like, oh, I, no, I play no, no, hundreds no, of games wonderful. of Axis yeah. and Allies. And, you know, if I try to play against somebody who's new to the game, like, I, I, I want to have fun. You know what I mean? I don't want them to get run over. And, I you know, and I, I want them to feel like they had a good time and had a chance to win. So, like... Give them an extra bomber in Russia, or you know, or, or you know, give them an extra thirty IPCs at the beginning of the game, or whatever it is that you're gonna, you know, whatever you're gonna do to 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 balance the skill level at the same time. But I, honestly, what I, you you hit on it exactly. Like what I've told people for years is like, if if you want to make a change to a game and you're having fun doing that thing, well, 
well, go do that thing. You know what I mean? Like, it's, it's kind of, yeah. it's just your experience. That, just know that you, you can't upset too much of the game or um, it'll not be worth your effort. Right. Yeah. Don't break it. <laughs> don't break it. Don't break it. That sums it up. Right. Um, so, so speaking of different ways to play the game, uh, recently a company called Beamdog uh, put out an, a version of Axis and Allies called Axis and Allies Online that is nearly identical to uh, 1942 Second Edition. And I'm curious uh, if you had any part in that project, or if you've had any other, um, ag- you know, any other interest in any of the other online versions of Axis and Allies that have come out over the years, and uh, and what your thoughts are about people playing your games online versus in person? Uh, yeah, the beam dog. Uh, I got notified when about this project by Wizards of the Coast. I got notified um, well after it had already begun. <laughs> so it was already off and running by the time I learned about it. But um, it, it, uh, it was based on the board game. It was a, a direct lift. Uh, so what more could be, you know, how could you hurt this or change this? So uh, it wasn't a really a design task that would involve me. It, it was just a straight lifting from the board game to um, the digital world. Um, I played it. I, I, I uh, was impressed with it. I really like it. Um, uh, so I was, I was satisfied with what they did. And um, I... Uh, I wish it success. <laughs> sure. Sure. Um, do you think that there's a big difference in, um, I mean, obviously there's a difference between the, uh, you know, playing online um, versus playing in person, but I'm, I'm curious uh, what your thoughts are if, from a game designer's point of view, like when you designed the game, this was, it was designed to be played across the table, right? Uh, how, how do you think it changes the game to have it, you know, be played with by people thousands of miles apart. Yeah, um, that's cool. Uh, it's a different experience. Um, I won't. I, I'm. I can't decide if one is better than the other. Um, frankly, um, I grew up uh, where we didn't have computers. Now we do. Hey, let's take advantage of that technology. Let's play our favorite games with some of our favorite friends who live in Paris or who live in Bangkok, and let's play Axis and Allies this afternoon. That's pretty cool. And so uh, there's a time and place for that. And then there's, wouldn't it be nice if my friend from Paris and Bangkok, we could all get in Paris and play the game there. And uh, so there's that. So, it, yeah, they don't compete. They complement each other. That's actually my, my thought as well. I love to talk trash at the table as much as the next guy. But uh, I've always felt a little weird about it when I play the Germans. Uh, you know, what do you, what do you say? You know, um, it feels a little, I don't know, you're, you're rooting for the bad guy, right? So as a, as a game designer, how do you... How do you handle that, right? So you're you're asking a player to root for a historically awful, horrific character. Um, how particularly, how, particularly the Nazis. Right. Uh, exactly. So so how do you deal with that as a game from a game design point of view? Here's how I do it. Um, I make I take the politics out of Axis and Allies. Um, it is the German arm. The German army. If I need a hero from Germany, you know, Rommel is always handy. You know, he uh, he turned out to be not such a great Nazi uh, after all, and, and and he's got all kinds of sex appeal in in terms of, uh, of the Desert Fox and North Africa and, and all that, and the um, uh, the Africa Corps, and so on. Uh, so uh, I, that's the realm, and that's where I limit it with Axis and Allies, is that this is a military uh, simulation. Uh, it's, a, it's a military game. So play it. Don't get into the politics of it. If you win, you are not now going to uh, uh, activate Nazi uh, philosophy. Right. right. Yeah, and that's, that's kind of how I've approached it and explained it to others, is that you know the game is a is a it's a it's a military thought experiment, right? Um, and 
you know, it's worth noting that that no version of Axis and Allies that that I've ever seen that was printed. I've seen, uh, you know, aftermarket people have done some things, but uh, I've never seen a, a box of Axis and Allies out of the box have a swastika in it. And and I think that, you know, obviously it was a, you know, that symbol was significant in World War II, and to to leave it out is a choice. And I think that that choice uh, speaks a lot to what this game is trying to accomplish. Yeah, I think I think uh, there is a, a swastika out there um, in one of the boxes in a very early uh, Milton Bradley game, probably the first edition. Ah. And that was gotten rid of uh, immediately uh, when it, you know it became an issue. Right. Boom! That swastika was gone, and with uh, it, it it, uh, it just disappeared quickly. So. Um, so there, there was a mistake made originally, and there was a swastika. I just wanted to clarify that. Sure. And point that out to you. Yeah. Well, I actually have a first edition of the game. I'm gonna have to go back and look and see if I can. Well, I think in a rule book there, you'll you'll see uh, this swastika behind this 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 very evil looking German officer. And, and anyway, uh, but that that was uh, that was ignorance more than anything else. Right, right, for sure. Well, yeah, and I, I appreciate that. So, and I'm I'm glad that they were able to make that make that determination and, and make that correction as as quickly as they did. Uh, well, I, I, I was surprised by that question. I'm surprised by that question. Uh, it's a it's a it's a great question. I thank you for asking it, and um, I've struggled with it, and uh, I am aware of what you're talking about. And uh, so. To sum it up again, just to say, I took the politics out of it. History, history should be able to go. I'm having a problem with. I want to do. I have been thinking about doing a civil war game, uh, uh, an Axis and Allies civil war game. And um, <clears throat> frankly, uh, I don't know how the economy would work. The North is like ten times the uh, industrial power that the South is, and so on, so on, so on, and. I really don't feel like uh, sitting down playing uh, a game with that damn uh, stars and bars. I just don't want it in my life, and uh, so, and I don't want to promote that. And so I said to myself, uh, I don't. I'm not going to do a civil war game. So, uh, so yeah, politics and so on in in, in uh, human human uh, human rights and so on. Uh, they play a role. And all of us, they should at least. Absolutely. On a lighter note, <laughs> uh, as much as we all love Axis and Eyes, of course we can talk about it all day. I understand you've got a new game coming out called Imperial Borders. It's apparently it's Napoleonic, and we're excited to hear about it. What can you tell us about it? Well, it's true, it's Napoleonic. <laughs> it's uh, it's um, it's. I absolutely love this game. Been working on it for now for about four years, and with my partner in crime, uh, Tom Gale. Uh, frankly, the two of us, I am just amazed how well it works, and from a designer's point of view, and how we support each other, and uh, we turn two brains into one. Uh, so I'm very lucky in that regard, and the the uh, the product that's benefiting from that directly right now is Imperial Borders. Also, War Room. Uh, Gail and I work together on War Room. All right, with that, uh, Imperial Borders, um, two scenarios. Uh, one, Napoleon, one at Waterloo. We play the what if. And the second scenario is, what if the Congress of Vienna failed and all six countries just started gobbling up whatever they could and it become a very competitive situation uh, and, 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 and Napoleon was just replaced by other tyrants or uh, military, military powers so uh, I love this game I can show you some images of it would you like to see some sure we'd love to uh, yeah let's see if we can do that because um, it's right behind me because this is this is where I work uh, and then I just turn around and there's my table of a uh, project that I'd be working on. That's the map of Imperial Borders. I don't know how clear or what you can see there. Yeah, no, it looks great. And, and then some of the 
accessories. Okay, so it looks like you're bringing figurines back into the Dream into your game I, design. Yeah, absolutely. So that's what I'm working on right now. And this game, um, 17th century, eight, uh, 19th century, early 19th century, I wanted to uh, have units that were a column of infantry. Okay. This is a prototype. I want this approach. I want want to get into the battlefield of this. Um, so, yeah, uh, it's it's really a very strong game. I could answer any specific questions if you want to do. Uh, how many players? Uh, six, six player. Okay. Six player, absolutely. Uh, is it two to six players, or do you need six? Uh, it's two. It's two to six player. Yeah. Okay. And yeah. Uh, if you could compare it to the complexity of some of your other games, uh, where do you think it falls in the spectrum? Uh, this is really um, not a complicated game. It's very fast moving. Absolutely little, if any, downtime. And uh, as a player, and um, complexity levels. There's a 22-page rule book. Uh, what it's, I don't know if it'll ultimately end up being 22, but it's in that general area. So it's it's probably easier to learn and to play than, um, say, War Room, or, or uh, certainly Action Allies. Be a lot. And um, um, it, it's addressing a lot of issues. Like uh, the game, the, the game will not be as long as a usual Larry Harris game. <laughs> yeah. Um, and um, so, yeah. So uh, I, I'd like to, maybe we can check in and talk about this game uh, uh, at some later date as it gets closer to what will be a Kickstarter to. Okay, so, so we expect the game to be available on Kickstarter. Any idea when you might uh, get to that? I think um, from my conversations with Tom, um, who's the publisher, by the way? Uh, okay. He okay. he's uh, hoping to have this uh, kickstart kickstarted sometime summer twenty one I think. Okay. Well, we'll certainly look forward to that. Uh, hopefully, if all goes to plan, we might be able to see that at Gen Con next year. Um, I I don't want to venture a guess. Okay. Well, great. Um, so yeah, we're super looking forward to that. I mean, you know, we're, I'm of course big fans of Axis and Allies, but. Uh, I while I haven't had a chance to play War Room yet, I've seen it in action a couple of times, and it looks it looks really interesting. Uh, maybe we talk about that for a minute and talk about how that that um, well maybe just the, the premise for how that game and how it differs from other Larry Harris games that we'd f be familiar with. Well, it's round. <laughs> yeah, that's what I, that was the big thing that I noticed is that it's, that it's a four foot round board. Uh, War Room. Oh, oh, labor of love there. The most beautiful game I've ever seen. Um, it uh, stack stacking units and so on. Uh, expensive, uh, but worth it. Um, what do you want me to say? Uh, it's um, it's uh, it's beautiful. It's absolutely stunning game. And, and the the components and so on. Um, the uh, game itself. Uh, it is um, an. Ex you know, it's an area movement combat World War II game, so by the same guy who designed Axis and Allies, but it's not Axis and Allies. Let's be clear. It's very different, yeah. and it's a different experience. Uh, and the fact that the world is round has, uh, gives you a whole other feel and perspective of the uh, board that you're playing on, and, of course, it's the same planet, but presented to you in a, in a different way. Right. I mean, it, the, the point of view of the map is straight down from the North Pole. Uh, and and there's, slanted, right? Yeah, yeah, it's right. And so like it, it's, it takes a second to to figure out like okay, so how does, where is North America compared to, uh, Antarctica? Like it's just like wait, hold on, wait. Um, you actually did that? Yeah, I do it all the time. Yeah, it takes me a second to like to get my like okay, so I'm here. Where's where's Moscow from here? Oh wait, it's it's over here. Right, so it, it takes a second to. To, to put it together, but uh, but once you understand kind of how the geography of it lays out, it it makes perfect sense. It just takes a second to make the adjustment. Yeah, uh, cool game. Uh, can't say enough good about it. Okay, well I will definitely make an effort to 
to, to get some folks together and, and, and give it a go. Is there, I haven't seen an online version for this game yet. Is that, does that exist? An online what? An online version for War Room? Is that a, is um, that a thing yet? There, there's um, there's some some stuff going on in that. Uh, it won't be a video game per se, but a, a, you know, you you pick up a piece and you move it with your with your uh, cursor. And um, Tom's uh, uh, working on that, and it seems to be coming along nicely. And so that will be up and coming again. Check back, and uh, we'll update you on that. Yeah. Well, fantastic. Um, so a lot of fans of uh, Board Game Nation um, are also up-and-coming game designers. And over your incredible career, you have seen just about everything there is to see in this industry. And I'm curious, what changes over your career have you found the most significant in the, the board game industry? And what advice do you have for, for people that are just kind of trying to get their first game out into the public? Uh, hmm. The money is in digital gaming. <laughs> okay. Go there. Uh, learn, learn Photoshop. What can I tell you? Um, I I didn't blaze any new trails in in the digital game design. I uh, I kind of was caught in in between with the the board gaming and and then when my Macintosh showed up in 1985 or something. Uh, so I was a late comer into that. But if you're born uh, with a cell phone in your hand, uh, and uh, most of our young up and coming designers were born in that time, uh, so, uh, you. Um, Stick with your digital, uh, but you can use board games, two-dimensional uh, games, to uh, be um, uh, your touchy-feely uh, that you design. For example, let me start. If I was to, it would be so easy now for me to do a um, a video game, a, um, a video game of uh, Imperial Borders, because the two-dimensional model and all the math to support it and so on is all there, already established. So you can create your uh, electronic games through two dimensional. So be able to do prototyping and play board games because, and as you're playing board games, think how you translate them into computer game. Is that helpful? Uh, no, absolutely. No, I... One of the reasons why Board Game Nation wanted to get into this uh, space and begin with is that the the world is moving more and more online. Retail shops are closing because they can't compete with you know all the other options that are available online. But the the one thing that bucks that trend are board game stores, and I think that's as a response to the digitalization of social interaction. Uh, so I think that there's value in continuing to have the two-dimensional tabletop, you know, board games or card games or role play games or, or whatever. Um, and I think that. Uh, from a game design point of view, I think you hit it exactly. Uh, if you want to have a successful game, I think that you need to be able to do both. I think that you need to be able to design a game that is engaging at the tabletop level, but can be translated into a digital model. Thank you. Uh, I couldn't have said it better myself. <laughs> That's for sure. <laughs> uh, no, I, I totally agree with that, of course. And yeah, this. Interesting, um, interesting time we're living in, don't you think? I mean, uh, the beginning of the electronic age, and and we're appreciating how uh, shocking it is, and efficient it is, and scary it is. Yeah, uh, for and, sure. And, oh, as for this board game uh, uh, phenomena, um, yeah, it's it's a need for social contact, I guess. Uh, I'm surprised by it. I love it, and um, it's, it, it's good to see. Yeah, for sure. Larry, thank you so much for taking the time. Uh, you've been super generous and, and sharing so much of your knowledge and experience and stories. Uh, you know, honestly, we could spend all day uh, doing this, and I, and I really appreciate you being generous with your feedback about the videos. And, uh, and if you want to talk more about Imperial Borders, you know, feel free to, to reach out uh, anytime, and we'll uh, be happy to do this again. Thank you, thank you, um, uh, and thank you for um, what you did with 1942.2. Um, that was uh, that was great. The, the the game will do nothing but benefit from it. Thank you.
Excellent. Well, thank you. Again, a huge thank you to Larry Harris for taking the time to share his stories and insights with us, and to our mutual friend for putting together the introduction. You can check out the Board Game Nation How to Play Axis and Allies 1942 Second Edition video by checking out the link in the description below. Plus, you can watch all of our videos on this game and many more on our channel, Board Game Nation. If you enjoyed this video, please take a second to give us a like and consider subscribing to our channel. Make sure you visit your local board game store to pick up a copy of any of the great games that we've talked about today and to meet people in your community that share a love for these great games. Again, this is Board Game Nation. My name is Gary Blevins. Thank you so much for watching, and we'll see you next time.